بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. How's everybody doing? الحمد لله. So uh, last week we got to the point where we were talking about the question. Uh, of course, we're dealing with the hadith of Inam al-A'mal bin Niyat, the first hadith of Imam al nawis Arba'in, of his 40 hadith collection, in which the Prophet says that indeed actions are by intentions, implying that actions are rooted in intentions, that that's where they come from, and that you will be rewarded uh, based on what you intended. And we asked the question, um, is it possible that you can have a good intention and then that intention changes due to praise? Uh, and therefore, should we try to avoid praise? And the last thing that we were talking about was the fact that, yes, you should avoid allowing your intention to change, definitely. For example, if you do something well, and then people start praising you for it, it's very possible that you now start to do it for the sake of praise. And you start to, that, that becomes the bigger, uh, you know, let's say, issue in your mind. That becomes the bigger motivator in your mind. However, that does not mean that you cannot be happy with praise. And we specifically quoted the hadith in which Abu Dhar, who he reported that uh, uh, somebody said to the Prophet ﷺ, what is your opinion about the person who has done a good deed and then the people praise him? And then he ﷺ, said, Tilka ajilu, uh, tilka ajilu This is the uh, glad tidings of a believer that comes, like it's like the, 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 the early glad tidings that come before the ajil, the long term glad tidings. In other words, it's like a preview. So subhanAllah, this is uh, very motivating for the believer that, you know, if you do something well, it's not wrong. Like a simple example, somebody asks you for some financial help. And so you say, Ya Allah, this is for your sake only. I'm doing this for you. You give the money for that person for, for the sake of Allah, not expecting any reward, not expecting even any thank you. You did it only for Allah's sake, as Allah mentions in Surah Insan, that we didn't do it for the, we didn't do it for the, th for the thanks. We didn't do it for the praise, right? Uh, uh, we did it only for the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah mentions this in Surah Insan So, but that being said If somebody does say thank you so much I was really in a bad spot And you know, you really helped me And may Allah bless you so much And I can't, I can't express how much this means to me It doesn't mean that you are therefore a hypocrite If you feel good about that In fact, that is the good, this is the, that's the glad tidings That is coming before the greater glad tidings Which is Jannah, inshaAllah ta'ala So yes and we also talked about, we were finishing about the, the question, why is it that working on your intentions is such a noble and high status of a deed? What, what makes it so, such a, a, a great act? And the fact is that it is private. So it has 100% ikhlas. And, and it has 100%, let's say, uh, uh, um, privacy. You can't show off your intention, right? There's no way of, like, I'm really sincere. Here, come check my heart. Like, it does, doesn't make any sense, right? So the more you do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's say, for example, there, you know, the, the masjid come, people come to the masjid and they pray their salah, right? Some people come, as we talked about, aada, aada versus ibadah, right? We talked about that before, how aada is just a habit. And then another person says, even though, even though, mashallah, it's good to have the habit of coming to the masjid, but you don't want it to turn into a habit in the sense that you're not even thinking about what you're doing. So one person might come because, you know, it's my routine. You know, work's over, I get something to eat, then I go for salat to then I go to bed. That's my normal day. So he just does that. And so he's rewarded according to his intent. Versus the other person who maybe it's part of his habit, but each step he's taking is saying, Ya Allah, I'm going, I'm going to your house to worship you. Oh Allah, this is my gratitude for every blessing that you've given me. I keep every step I'm going, he's making dua, and he's making adhkar, he's remembering Allah, etc., etc. All this is internal, right? His intent to please Allah Ta'ala is internal. So that's what makes it such a, a lofty deed. Another, this, this by the way, the, the, the fact that intentions are weighed so heavily actually answers a very important theological question that a lot of people ask. What is that theological question? Why is it that heaven and hell is forever? Right? People ask this question all the time. They say, I, we only live for a few years. That means if the criminal does crimes for a few years, should he burn for, for eternity? And if the believer just worshiped for a couple of years, he should go to paradise forever? How is, this, how is this right? Eternal rewards, eternal punishment, I don't understand. But when you pay attention and realize that, well, yes, the external dimension is the physical body that, you know, grows and then becomes old and then breaks down and then dies. That's the external dimension. However, the internal dimension of niyyah, or the purity of your ruh, of your soul, that is something that does not deteriorate. That is something that is eternal, right? And that is something that once you have developed that sincere intention, the whole idea is that you would continue. You have the intention to keep worshiping Allah. If you lived another hundred years, you, you have the intention to worship for another hundred years. 
If you live for a thousand years, you have the intention to keep worshiping and keep learning and keep studying and keep on being a benefit to humanity for another thousand years. And so because of that intention, subhanAllah, and the fact that إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ The fact that Allah is rewarding us based on our intention. Well, I had an intention to keep worshiping Allah for how long? As long as I live. So your intention was to worship forever. Yeah, okay, you're rewarded forever. And you just so happened that you got, you know, I don't know, last time Allah hit by a bus or whatever the case is, may Allah protect us. But the point is that you had the intent to keep going forever. Same thing with the disbeliever. I only did crimes for a couple of years. Yeah, but what was your intention? Your intention was to cheat people in business here, gain some more money, then cheat some more people there, gain some more money, then cheat. You were going to keep going. The more rope I gave you, the more you would have been like Fir'aun. And had I given Fir'aun more rope, he would have, instead of just being the uh, tyrant of Misr, he would have been the tyrant of the world if he could have, right? He would have, his intent is what is being rewarded or punished. SubhanAllah. So that's a very important theological... By the way, there's multiple ways to answer this question of why... why I, I, in fact, if you go on YouTube and look up my name and just look up the word my name and then hell or is hell justified or is hell reasonable, something like that. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'll have a, a, an entire video specifically discussing this question uh, because it, it comes up a lot. You know, the young people often have this question of why is hell, uh, you know, so harsh and eternal, etc. And so I'm, I answer it from multiple perspectives, but this is just one. Khair, inshallah. Intention is so important that the first three people to be judged on Judgment Day, as the hadith of the Prophet mentions, are who? Which, well, who are the th first three people? Al -a yeah, the Alim, yes. The Qari, or yeah, exactly. The, the Mujahid, that's right. So the, the first three people, no, 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 sorry, sorry. The, the Alim and the Qari kind of go hand in hand, sorry. It's the second one is the. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. The one who, the, the charitable person. So the three people are uh, the one who was very knowledgeable in Islam. I, I don't know if I'm getting the order right. But anyway, the, 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 very knowledgeable in Islam, the one who was very generous, and then the, the, the Mujahid who fought Fisa Billah. And all three of them will say, Ya Allah, I did it for your sake. Ya Allah, I, I, I studied ilm and I taught ilm for your sake. And you'll be told you're a liar, you did it so the people would say, MashaAllah, you're so knowledgeable. They, they, you, they gave you exactly what you wanted. You wanted them to say, MashaAllah, and give you a nice title, and give you the plaque on the wall, and, and give you the nice office. That's what you wanted, right? You got it, right? Yeah, I got it. Okay, khalas, you have nothing with me. That's it. Same thing with the, the one who was generous. Ya Allah, I gave so much in charity for your sake. You're lying. Why did you give that money? Fisa billah, oh, excuse me, why did you give that money, uh, why did you give that money in charity? Not fisa billah, not for the sake of Allah, rather so that everybody would say, what? You were a generous person, and oh, uh, you know, what a great guy, and he's so generous, and they gave you all the praise that you wanted, and now you have nothing with me. And the mujahid, same thing, you did it, you fought so that you could be said, so it would be, it would be said of you how brave you were. And the people said you were very brave, and that's it, that's all you get. Yes. It's also very important, because oftentimes we think to ourselves that, you know, I'm doing a fard, uh, uh, you know, because obviously it's, it's, it's uh, obligatory for me to pray or to fast, etc. And so I'm doing it because that's what everybody else does. It's important to remember to have the intention that I'm fulfilling this for the sake of Allah. But also, on the flip side, haram. Because it's very easy to simply stay away from haram because it's not part of your system. It's not part of your lifestyle. It's not around you, right? But it's much better to remember that, you know, of course these things may be uh, uh, available for me. But Ya Allah, I'm avoiding this for your sake, right? So it's not, I mean, obviously, alhamdulillah, if you live in a good environment with, without, let's say, alcohol around you, or let's say you live in a neighborhood where there's no, let's say, clubs or bars or whatever the case is, that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, instead of it just being a cultural, like, oh, we culturally, as Muslims, we don't do this, right? Like, it's just not part of our lifestyle. No, you should always try to make the intent and say, Ya Allah, I am doing my, the halal, uh, I'm not just the halal, but the wajib, the, the obligatory or the fard for your sake, and I'm staying away from haram for your sake as well. So don't let the uh, 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 um, um, refraining from haram become a habit as well. So I just want to mention that because inshallah you're, you get rewarded for that. You get rewarded the more you recognize and make the uh, uh, conscious intention to stay away from those things. So that's the, fir that's the first part of the hadith then. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Then whoever migrated to obey Allah and His Messenger, then his migration is and then you could say what's, uh, uh, you know, taqdeer, um, uh, like the, what is implied, right? What is, you could say, mahdhuf or uh, omitted is the idea of saying, rewarded according to his obedience to Allah and his messenger. So the statement says, whoever migrated for, uh, to, uh, uh, whoever migrated, uh, uh, for Allah and his messenger, then his migration is for Allah and his messenger. And you say, well, that seems redundant, right? But the implication is that then the reward of it is for his obedience to Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, subhanAllah, and then, وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِلدُّنْيَا 
يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه. Then, uh, then the Prophet says, then whoever his hijra was for the sake of some sort of dunya to achieve something, like he's, he's, he's traveling from Mecca to Medina just for the sake of business, or for a woman to marry, and we talked about that, how there's this, uh, uh, some narrations that talk about how there was a specific guy who wanted to marry a specific sister, and she said, only if you make hijra. But again, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's questionable whether that narration specifically applies to this hadith or not, but anyway, it's left open-ended. But the point is, the Prophet mentioned two big things, two big motivations, and then he said, فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَجْرَ إِلَيْهِ And then left it open-ended. So, if you did it for the sake of dunya, for the sake of a woman, then your reward is, he doesn't say for the sake of the dunya and for the woman, he says for whatever. So the idea of the last part saying whatever it was for implies and any other intention. Any other intention, that's what your reward is going to be for. Now, if, if you might as well just say whatever you, whatever you intend, that's going to be your reward, why give two specific examples? If at the end of the hadith you're going to say anyway, فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَجْرَ إِلَيْهِ You're going to get whatever you intended, then why specifically give the examples of the dunya? and of going for the sake of a woman. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, but some scholars, they take from this, that the two great fitnas, specifically for men, and you could also say for women, is what? Dunya, as in worldly material benefits, and the opposite gender. These are the two strongest motivators after the correct motivation, which is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the things that draw us and attract us and, and pull us in the most. And so it's perfectly reasonable and quite beautiful and perfect that the fact that the Prophet ﷺ specified two things and said, listen, your intent has to be for Allah, but if I'm going to mention two things that are very relevant, you might get deterred. Your intention might get veered off track because of what? Because you might get, you know, the allure of some business trade that completely changes your intent or because of a woman that completely changes your intent. Again, this doesn't mean that you can't, once you know that your intention is for the, for the sake of Allah, it doesn't mean that you can't have the side intention of saying, well, I, I have to live there, so I do see a business opportunity. I am going to take advantage of it. But ultimately, Ya Allah, the purpose of my uh, do, getting, going through this business transaction is for your sake. Why? Because it's halal and it's a good income. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a respectable uh, livelihood. And same thing with marriage. Sometimes a person goes and studies Islam in a certain place, and then, of course, their intention is to study Islam, to get closer to Allah. And then as they're there, they say, subhanAllah, you know, there's, there are sisters that are studying Islam as well at this school. You know, and then you talk to your teachers and you find out this one's compatible, compatible with you and then you get married. So does that mean that your entire niyyah was destroyed and that you never once were sincere to Allah for your studies? No, of course not. You, even your marriage was sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your marriage ultimately was, I want to marry a sister who's practicing, right? So all this is saying that don't allow it to overcome the ultimate intent, which is always going back to Allah ta'ala. However, there's a beautiful hadith uh, in Sahih Muslim in which the Prophet says, Inna dunya uh, hulwatun. Uh, uh, that the Prophet says, the world is sweet and green. And the idea of green is like it's alluring. It's, it's like, you know, it's like uh, fresh and, you know, it's, it's, it, this whole dunya, it really captures your eyes. It is sweet and it is alluring. And indeed, Allah Ta'ala is going to install you as vicegerents or mustakhlifin, like, like he's going to leave you as, uh, you know, people that uh, inherit one generation after the next. You are going to be in charge, basically. The Prophet is, is, is basically describing to the Sahaba, you Muslims, you're going to conquer great lands. You're going to be in charge of great wealth. And you're going to go generation after generation with a lot of power. So you have to realize this. And n now that you understand this, that the next point is, uh, oh yeah, and then he says, uh, you guys are going to be the vicegerents in it in order to see how you act. This is a test. Allah Ta'ala is going to put you in charge of whatever you're going to be in charge of. You're going to get power over a family, over a, a house, over a car, over a business. Whatever it is, you're going to have, be given some sort of power in your life. And it's going to be a succession of one generation after the other to test you. So avoid the allurement of فَاتَّقُوا uh, dunya. Uh, so then fear or have taqwa of this dunya or be conscious of this dunya. وَاتَّقُوا nisa And be fearful of women. And now this is obviously referring to the men, but vice versa. Obviously for the sisters, it would be be uh, uh, cautious of and have taqwa, have consciousness of Allah Ta'ala with regards to um, uh, men, and so vice versa. Because why? Because indeed, فَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ فِتْنَةِ بَنِي إسرائيل, Because indeed the very first fitna of Bani Israel كانت في النساء. It was in 
women. As in Bani, Bani Israel, the thing that they were the most affected by was they, they, they fell into too much, uh, you could say, licentiousness. This is the thing that really broke their resolve uh, first and foremost. And I, this shouldn't be a shock to anybody. I mean, of course, we are drawn to many different things in dunya, but I think it's no shock to anybody that, uh, uh, you know, uh, sexual attraction is, you know, why is it that every, every advertisement, almost every advertisement, they use some sort of a model, right, to grab your attention? Why is that? Is, it, is there any mystery that uh, human beings are naturally attracted to one another? So there's nothing wrong with that, and alhamdulillah, this is why nikah is halal, so there's nothing, it's not uh, uh, evil in and of itself. However, this can be a fitna for you. And so it's just interesting that the Prophet says these are the two big fitness, dunya and then, you know, sexuality essentially. And then this hadith is specifically saying, listen, make hijrah for the sake of Allah. Be careful, you might get deterred by different intentions, one dunya or one for women. So it's, subhanAllah, it's very, very uh, perfectly uh, put together. Now this come, brings us to the next big topic, inshallah ta'ala, uh, which is a very important topic, especially for us. And when I say us, I mean Muslims living in the Western world. Uh, which is, why are we here, right? The big question, right? The big question of why are Muslims in the West to begin with? Uh, because this hadith, even though, of course, it started with the, the, the broad concept of, of intention in all matters, no matter what you're doing, it got more specific to hijrah, of migration. And it just so happens that uh, from roughly the 60s, excuse me, 70s and 80s, I think those, I remember reading it somewhere that they said that in the 70s and 80s, that's when the really large number of, uh, of immigrants were coming from the Middle East and from all around the world, from Muslim countries, and coming to the West. Of course, there were Muslims in North America before that, uh, but we're talking about in large, uh, large numbers. And so it was really, subhanAllah, the, the most important thing to remember about that, in my opinion, because oftentimes the younger generation, we like to criticize the older generation, right? We like to say, oh, they're, you know, here are all their flaws. But I think it's very, very important for myself and for all of us younger generation to remember something so, you know, when you think about it, it's very powerful. During that time, let's say during the 70s or 80s, how many masajid were in North America? I know that there was about maybe two in Canada, in all of Canada. So as a Canadian, I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar. There was the first masjid in all of Canada was in Winnipeg. And then the second one was ICQ in Montreal, which is, I, I know about it because I used to go there. Uh, ICQ stands for Islamic Center Quebec, right? That was the second masjid, right? In all of, you know how big Canada is? <laughs> it's a big country. And that was the second. And then after that, alhamdulillah, now, now today, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, no, either hundreds or thousands, thousands probably. So my point is to say that, subhanAllah, you can't go to any major city. If you drive for 10, 15 minutes, you're going to get from one masjid to the next masjid to the next masjid every 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes even less than that, right? in every major city, both in Canada and in the US, right? So that's, that's incredible. So we're talking about one generation, the generation that are getting older now, the generation that are passing away, that generation, some of them worked extremely hard to build those masajid and essentially establish the infrastructure for Islam in North America. Some people worked diligently for that construction so that the next generation can take the, you know, pass the torch and we could take it and we can move with it, right? Um, and others, you know, weren't involved, others were, didn't participate. And so, you know, that, as that generation gets older and as that generation passes, each one of them is going to get rewarded for what their contribution was. But it's very, very clear, it should be very clear in all of our minds as the younger generation that was born in North America. We should be very clear about this fact, that the previous, our parents' generation, they came here with no masajid pretty much. It was, it was, it was close to zero, right? It was, it was very, most cities had almost none. Right? And they just built and built and built. And now we can comfortably say to ourselves, do we, do we, where do you want to pray tarawih? Do you want to pray salat tarawih on this masjid or at that one? Do you want to drive? I, I like the qira'a over there. I've heard these conversations you know, growing up countless times. And so comfortably, I, I, I kind of want to go there. I want to, kind of, I, I want to go there. Oh, their iftar is better. They got better food. You know? And young kids are talking about this so comfortably, not realizing that just a few years ago, none of these existed. And so you're so critical of the older generation. Meanwhile, subhanAllah, look what they did for you. So, those who actually put in the work, then subhanAllah, hijratuhu ila ma kana, ila ma hajra ilayh, then his, the reward of his hijrah will be for what he made hijrah for. If his intention was to say, Ya Allah, I'm trying to get away from either, let's say, persecution, I'm trying to get away from poverty, I'm trying to get, you know, uh, uh, live a, a good life, uh, uh, a peaceful life, but Ya Allah, I'm not just, you know, going to the West so I can lose my deen, rather, I'm going to try to proactively sow the seeds to ensure that Islam keeps growing. 
And then, inshallah, their reward is that. And then other people, they came here, they never come to the masjid, they have nothing to do with it, they just really, they saw an opportunity in terms of dunya, so they made hijrah for that sake. And I'm not the one to judge. And uh, I don't think any of us, I mean, especially as younger, uh, Western-born uh, 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 youth, you could say, uh, for us to um, uh, point a finger or criticize, uh, we're not, we don't know what they went through, simply put. Being, being born and raised here, we don't really know what that generation has gone through. But we, what we, I think it's fair to say, and I think we should say, that each person is going to be rewarded according to their intention. And so you really have to ask yourself, what was your objective behind your hijrah? So, uh, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. I, I do want to, since we're on the topic, I think it's very important to realize, and I'm, I might repeat this point in different talks, uh, because it's so, so critical. The, the previous generation, as I said, their main job was building. And for good reason, because there were no masajid, pretty much no masajid in North America, and subhanAllah, now there are thousands. If we as the younger generation think that we are just going to keep on doing the exact same thing and doing fundraisers to build more and more masajid, then those masajid are going to be empty. That we, we need to realize that the time is not for just building, building more and more and more. That's not the objective. Alhamdulillah, this new project is being built. Once it's built, what do we do? Do we say, okay, now what do we raise money for? Another building and another building and another building? SubhanAllah, you have to, I believe that our generation, the younger generation, has to be so grateful to the older generation for building that physical infrastructure but we have to shift the gears and we have to change the focus from building things and places to building people. So instead of doing a fundraiser, well, how, who's going to give thousands of dollars to, you know, for the, to build a masjid, Allah's going to build for you a, a, a palace and, and paradise and, and, you know, and so on and so forth. All these beautiful reminders, we need to start saying, who's going to sponsor this person's scholarship? Who's going to sponsor this young person to study Dean for a year or for two years? Who's going to sponsor this uh, youth group to go and study this or, or learn that? We need to not be investing just in places, but in people. I very much believe this because not, not necessarily here, but in many, many places, many communities, they've built the masajid and now they're, they're, not, they're not seeing the attraction because they haven't built the human resources. It's not enough to just have, let's say, one imam, he leads the five times daily salawat and that's it. What about a youth director? What about a, a marriage counselor? What about uh, you know, a, a therapist? Uh, what about, you know, so many different functions that are human resources that require training and re require, you know, the, the community to get behind it and to put in wealth behind it. So when it comes to the whole issue of hijrah and living in the West, I think uh, uh, it's, th these are very, very important points to recognize that, yes, stage one, phase one, generation one, building the infrastructure. Phase two, building the people, building the actual workers so that, inshallah ta'ala, the community can be stronger. This is my perspective on this uh, matter, and I'm open to uh, discuss it more at the end, inshallah. I just wanted to mention a few uh, uh, more points in terms of this issue of how important niyyah and intention is. We should have presence of mind in what we do. And I'll give you a simple example. When people come for Salatul Jummah, alhamdulillah, last week we had 200 people, so the, the COVID situation is slowing down. More and more people are feeling comfortable to come to the masjid, alhamdulillah. You could say that there are 10 different types of people to come to the masjid. Each of them different based on their intent. So let's pay attention. Let's say there's the type of person that comes with the only intention to hear something negative, something questionable from the imam so they can attack Islam. This happens. It's true. They're usually non-Muslims. You know, maybe they, you know, uh, they, they come and they, they say, oh, you know, the, I don't like these Muslims in our, in our neighborhood. I'm going to try to find out. I'm going to try to hear them say something bad, and then I'm going to try to report them to the police or whatever and try to get them in trouble. This is one intention. It is an intention. Now, that person, he walks in like everybody else. He stands up and prays the salat like everybody else. But the intention is different. You guys get it? So that's one intention. You're just there to try to find something negative on this community so you can destroy it. That's one intention. He looks like everybody else, though. Another intention. You're forced by your family. I don't want to be here. I don't like coming here. But my family said, come on, it's Jummah, get ready. Come on, wash up. Let's go. So you're only there because you were forced because, let's say, cultural habit, quote unquote. Number three, you're bored. You know, I don't know what else to do. It's Friday. You know, uh, you might as well, you know, just go out, do something. So you just go. Number four, routine. It's not necessarily that you're bored, but it's that, like, look, this is who I am. This is part of my routine. You know, every Friday I go, I hear the talk, and then I come, come home. It's part of routine. That's four. Number five, for socialization purposes. You go to Jummah. Why? Because you want to see the community. Hey, brother, good to see you. Mashallah. 
You know, I love, you know, I love going to Juma. Juma is beautiful. We all stand next to each other. Usually we stand next to each other. <laughs> but anyway, there, was, there once was a time that we actually stood shoulder to shoulder and that we would, you know, pray together. And then afterwards we talk and maybe we go grab some food. You know, whatever. It's social. Number six, because it feels good. You know, it's just a nice, it's nice, a sense of community. It's, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive thing. Everybody's all fresh and cleaned up and dresses nice. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice place. It feels good. Now, number seven, for the sake of obedience to Allah Ta'ala. Why? I'm doing this because Allah commanded me to go to Jummah. Therefore, I want to obey that command. I'm going to go. Number eight, I'm hoping for some guidance. On top of obeying Allah Ta'ala, yes, of course, it's fard and therefore I must go to Jummah. But on top of that, I don't just go there because I have to. I go there because I have to, because Allah commanded it. And on top of that, Allah is al-hadi. Allah is the guide. And so I'm saying, oh Allah, who, you are the guide. Guide me through this khutbah. Whatever the khatib says, let it hit my heart and actually benefit me. Number nine, you're obeying Allah. You're hoping for guidance. And on top of that, you want, our, you want to specifically look for an actionable item. It's one thing to want guidance. It's another thing to say, oh Allah, I'm doing this to obey you because I want guidance because whatever I hear, I'm going to do it right away. If the khutbah is about charity, I'm going to give charity. If the khutbah is about praying qiyam layl I'm going to get up tonight. If the khutbah is about whatever, being good to my parents, I'm going to go home and do something good to my parents, inshallah ta'ala. Whatever the case is, I'm going to grab an actionable item and I'm going to apply it in this jummah. Right? And number 10, you're seeking obedience to Allah, guidance, an actionable item, and wisdom so that you can share it. Number 10, Oh Allah, I want to obey you, I want to take your guidance, I want to apply it myself, and then I want to share it with my friends and family. Now, do you guys, now, now imagine, me, imagine my position or any position of the khatib standing there, looking down and all he sees is people, right? You just see people, you just see people listening to the khutbah, you have no idea. But imagine if you could look in, imagine if you had the, you know, vision, that you could see, subhanAllah, this guy's niya, look at this, it's like a mountain. And this guy's knee, it's like a pit, it's like the pits of hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? SubhanAllah, look at, look at the range to the khatib and to one another. We look around, we just see a bunch of people that come, sit, listen, and leave, right? It always looks the same. It's just come, listen, go. SubhanAllah, when you pay attention to niyyah, you say, SubhanAllah, look at the darajat. Ten, ten different degrees. And that's just something I can't, I'm sure we could come up with more degrees. This is just my own musings, you could say. So yes, we should never forget the quote from Abdullah bin Mubarak, rahimahullah, which he says, رُبَّ عَمَلٍ صَغِيرٍ تُعَظِّمُهُ النِّيَّةِ uh, وَرُبَّ عَمَلٍ كَبِيرٍ تُسَغِرُهُ النِّيَّةِ That perhaps a small deed can become big and huge because of its intention, and perhaps a big deed can become very small because of its intention. So it's always, it always goes back to your intent. Whether the deed is big or small, if you have a big intention behind it or a small intention behind it, that's going to uh, determine how much ajr you get, inshallah ta'ala. Now, there are, now, the question might come, if this is such an important fundamental hadith, why is it mentioned only in hadith and we don't find it in the Qur'an? Why didn't Allah reveal in the Qur'an, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِنْيَاتِ If it's so important, right? So, there are many, many ayat which explain this concept. And we can go through many of them, inshallah ta'ala, to show how the Qur'an does highlight the import, importance of intention. Number one, Allah ta'ala says what? Your whole purpose of life is to worship Allah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Your whole objective of life is to worship Allah. But more specifically, Allah says what? وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Right? So the first one's in Surah Adhariyat. The second one, we're talking about Surah Bayina. But the point is that Allah specifies and says, you're only truly as, وَمَا أُمِرُوا And they were not commanded, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ Except to worship Allah, مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ With pure ikhlas and sincerity, with firm intention, not going through the motions, not out of habit. No, with f uh, pure intentions, not for the sake of, let's say, showing off or whatever, only for the intention of making your whole deen, your whole way of life, your whole religion, Ikhlas, purely and sincerely for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. Mukhlisin lahuddin hunafa and on the Hanif, on the on the natural inclination of Tawheed and so on and so forth. Inshallah we'll get to that surah, we'll do tafsir of that ayah in more detail. But the point is to say that yes, this is mentioned, the idea of having sincere intentions. Every time Allah Ta'ala talks about ikhlas in the Quran, this is talking about your intent, right? You're purifying your intentions. Furthermore, Allah Ta'ala is not going to judge us based on the quantity of our deeds, but rather the quality of our deeds. And the evidence for this is Tabarak al-Ladhi biyadihi al-Murku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir al-Ladhi khalaq al-Mawt wa al-Hayat al-Yabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala wa huwa al-Aziz al-Ghafur. The first two ayat of Surah Tabarak, Allah says, "Blessed is he in whose hands is the dominion, and he is over all things competent, and it is he who created Allah who created death and life to test you, which is ahsanu amalan, not akthar amalan." Allah didn't say who is the most in deeds. 
Allah said, أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Not أَكْثَرْ uh, quantity, أَحْسَنُ quant uh, Excuse me, I flipped that, I said it wrong. Uh, not in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality. What has the most ihsan? And so one interpretation is the intent behind it. It's not about the, 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 how big the deed is, it's what was the intent behind it, the, 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 the sincerity behind it.